This is Natasha D'Souza reporting for SALT Voices, and I'm here at SALT Abu Dhabi with Deborah Quazo, the Managing Director of GSB Ventures based in San Francisco. That's right. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you, Natasha. Great connecting with you. Your you panel discussion today was refreshing, I think, to listen yeah. to. You shared some really interesting insights when it comes to ed tech and workforce tech. Take us through maybe two or three of the key takeaways from that discussion. Yeah, I think the, the takeaways where we talked a little, a lot about, about emerging markets and the opportunities to use technology to really scale education, where you have large numbers of people who, who need to be skilled, reskilled, um, educated. And I think some of the benefits of emerging markets versus developed markets are that there is, they're not necessarily always a built up legacy of the way things have been done. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is a huge advantage. Um, when you're trying to innovate and do something differently. So, so a I think greenfield space. Just where you don't, can yes, just go you don't have to always have the same obstacles right. that, that other um, highly, highly defined, uh, developed and defined markets have. So it's, it's an interesting opportunity to apply um, education technology skill, and then workforce technology, which we see as skilling and reskilling. Um, it, it workers who, as jobs become, uh, as jobs rapidly change Correct. and obsolescence and mm -hmm. AI, et cetera, um, are changing are changing the parameters of jobs so quickly that there's there's a um, enormous need to skill and reskill employees really globally. So it's not really a developed and emerging market. So then, if issue, we take then, that kind of global opportunity yep. and with that lens look at you know the Middle East, yep. and maybe emerging markets broadly. Yep. What does the opportunity look like here in MENA, and how may it differ compared to other emerging or growth markets in your view? Well, I think that I think that um, the opportunity in MENA is that it's, it's probably pretty similar. I mean, I think we all, you know, we all have, including the United States, um, a large chunk of our population. In the U.S., we only have 30 percent um, of the population has a college degree. And when mm -hmm. you look at it going forward, 60 to 70, maybe even 80 percent of the population is going to need to have some sort of college degree or college-like degree, a mm -hmm. certificate or whatever, mm -hmm. in order to, you know, to be qualified to do jobs. Even, there, even in this new age of knowledge, even, like well, a degree I, is still going to be seen may not have important? to be a degree, may not have to be a degree, but, but it will have to be a higher level of education okay. or a high, higher level of skilling. There's actually a wonderful article today in the Wall Street Journal about how factory work has gotten so much more sophisticated that, that, that you're having to upskill and upskill factory workers okay. to be more technologically savvy in order to ma you know, maintain the relevance of factories. So, I think we're seeing that is that's a relevant thing as much in the U.S. as it is here in MENA. Mm -hmm. um, I think the um, so I actually think the phenomenon of the skills gaps um, that exist, the education that gaps that exist socioeconomically, is really pretty much a pervasive global phenomenon. Perhaps countries like China may be outshining um, right. the rest of us, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it, as it relates to overcoming some of these um, gaps. But um, but 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 it is actually a pretty pretty widespread need. And what you've seen, interestingly, I think in MENA, is a pretty active um, role of government in, yes. in, in putting funding into skilling and reskilling in particular. Mm -hmm. um, education systems, K-12 for sure, and actually even higher education tend to be private here. Mm -hmm. um, in the U.S., they're actually dominated by public, and, and that's got positives and negatives. Um, but, uh, but, but certainly as you get into the workforce, I think you're seeing government play a very proactive role here um, relative to this overwhelming problem. I think in the U.S., you see government there, but you see, I think you see corporations taking a more active role. You say in, corporations and startups, perhaps. Oh, corporations working with startups. So corporations okay. working with tech startups um, to actually find new solutions. And we, the way we see it is corporations are becoming the fourth education system in the world because, and really for two reasons. You can actually explain that to me. Yeah, That's really interesting. Well, it's, it's, I mean, they're really, there are two causes for it. It is one, um, corporations, you know, have a talent shortage for the most part globally. Um, and they are also, and they have this issue of job obsolescence and they're ingesting, they're inheriting or ingesting students and employees who are mm -hmm. coming out of systems that are broken downstream. Mm -hmm. Not in every country, certainly we have, but certainly in the United States, we have massive issues with the ability to turn out job ready, career ready students okay. from the higher, the high school system and the higher ed system. So okay. we're seeing corporations realize finally that they have to invest in lifelong learning for, for these mm -hmm. two reasons. The first reason is that they have to, one, re, you know, they have to skill and educate 
their incoming employees, and then they're going to have to reskill and re-educate their employees for the rest of their careers. But, uh, but is it fair to say? I mean, today the average, you know, span the time is length of time that an employee spends in an organization is so much smaller. So how much in how truly yeah. how invested are corporations? I think it's fascinating. Today, so what, yeah. what you're seeing in the U.S. and we're we're, um, uh, we're actually calling it learning to leave. So we're actually seeing a number. We're seeing a number of companies. Actually, Amazon would be one of them. Mm -hmm. Starbucks really was the leader. Um, Walmart, for that matter, who are investing in their employees, realizing in Amazon's case, they are investing in the education of their um, of their fulfillment center employees because they know those employees will be out of jobs at, at Amazon in, in the next in the next one to three years because okay. of the automation of the of the film. So this is centers. a way to find them relevant so it's and actually, keep them the company. Well not necessarily. Okay. Actually that's why we call it learning to leave because we have companies that are actually training, educating, skilling employees so that they may have jobs at other places. Because Amazon's not going to necessarily have the demand. Some of those employees probably will, okay. you know, will be ingested into other places at Amazon, but others will go on to do jobs in other okay. parts of the economy. So it's, it's Almost a, like a public service it's a benefit, really of. interesting move on okay. the part of employers. I mean, Starbucks really began this a number of years ago when they they offered um, college completion as a corporate benefit, mm -hmm. uh, working in partnership with Arizona State University, who's a big partner of ours actually. And um, it, they were really the first people to step out there to realize that, that baristas were not going to be, you know, it would not be in the best interest of baristas or, frankly, Starbucks if baristas stayed in their jobs for their entire career. Okay. And um, it would be an economic, it economically would impair Starbucks, it would economically impair the, the, the barista employees. Mm -hmm. And so they began offering this free college completion and actually now college beginning, they were originally just for people who already had some credits, now it's for people who just want to get a degree and then will be qualified to go on and do it a job, maybe at Starbucks, but more likely in a job at some other, at another company. Interesting. So and these are skills. companies almost investing in their employees, knowing as fully a, well as a that, social service, that you're making them employable that we're making, the, we're making the world different. a better place. Now, um, okay, you talked about skills gap. If no, you were to point out maybe you know, one or two particular skills gap that are especially, you know, painful and need require immediate attention, well, what would those be? Yeah, I mean, the obvious ones are, you know, the, the data sciences and okay. people cannot hire or find or locate or train data scientists. I mean, the, the, the appetite for employees in the areas of data science are just, uh, are just you know, absolutely, um, uh, you know, beyond any anything we can do to fill, fulfill that that talent demand. Interesting, we were talking about this on the panel. Teachers are an area globally mm -hmm. um, that are there are massive teacher shortages globally. We're seeing huge teacher shortages in the U.S. Um, so it's something that people don't typically think about when right. you start talking about skills gaps. But we do not have we have teachers all over the world retiring really, you know, in, in sort of the normal demographic pattern, not enough teachers coming into the system. So that's another, you know, that's another large area of okay. sort of talent demand that is not, you know, that the current population cannot, cannot um, supply. Um, but then I think, then you can, you can certainly go all over the tech stack. I mean, it's going to be, whether it's artificial intelligence or deep learning or, or data science or, or more simple areas of, um, of technology around data analytics, uh, the the talent demand there uh, cannot be met today. By the, okay. It's in the millions. So it essentially depends on how our children are being schooled today. And whether we begin to start, we, we've actually invested in a startup company that's teaching artificial intelligence and data science uh, in a consumer model at, for as early as third grade. And wow. so beginning to teach computation, it's really about computational thinking, okay. getting children thinking, understanding what comp, what a mind, computational thinking mindset is. Um, so that, because, and, and the reality is, the, the reason we think this company is critically important is that we think it's gonna be hard for our K-12 system to adjust quickly enough mm -hmm. to be able to, to, to provide the kind of learning around computational thinking that's gonna be required in the workforce, so. Then can I ask, I mean, yep. when we talk about how important these skills are, 
where do the arts, the traditional liberal that's, arts, fall that's into a, play? Because that's, that's you know, a as great, a, uh, the world yeah. still needs yeah. its, its artists, its thinkers. Well, they also need. They also need. People call them soft skills. We call them power skills. People also need empathy and yes, speaking. Yes, to connect with human so beings. So yes. totally agree. We think it's equally important, and that's why you know everything's not going to go online, or, or if it goes online, it's going to need to be in a peer-based system where people are interacting and developing social skills. Yeah. So I think that we. We've actually, interestingly, separately invested in a, um, in a, in a K-12 company that's actually delivering uh, a video, a, a world-class video delivery of, of dance and musical theater instruction okay. uh, into, into K-12 schools in the U.S. Um, because the funding for that kind of thing in, in U.S. public school systems has been cut dramatically. And this is a very compelling economic and artistic offering. So it, it I, I think... Um, there's no question that we need to, we can't just, everybody, everybody can't learn to code and we solve the world's issues. That's, mm. that, that's not going to be the solution that we, <laughs> that we find. Um, we, you know, we, they, it has to be coupled with um, the technical skills have to be filled so jobs can be figured because there are millions of open jobs right now in, the, in those technical areas. Um, but it's got to be uh, twinned with the ability to have critical thinking and, you know, um, emotional capabilities and communication and all those sorts of things that are that are critical power skills so um, we have a lot of demand on our educational systems or our educational alternatives right now to get to get our populate all of our populations uh, job ready but um, we agree it needs to be very holistic okay well you've shared some fascinating insights with us I really enjoyed this discussion thank with you. you thank you so much Deborah. Thanks, it's Sasha. been great speaking thank with you. you thank you